Yeah, talking tax with Tom. That's Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We're going to talk today about the shadow budget. You've heard of the shadow docket of the Supreme Court. And, uh, you know, that uh, kind of conveys the notion that it's not quite right, um, that the shadow docket is actually a way the Supreme Court cuts corners and, and cheats on providing the justification for their decisions. You know, that's what they say. And so when Tom selected this topic, Hawaii shadow budget, I was very interested. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jay. Shadow budget, and it's very provocative and and very, it's a curious title for a complex um, notion. And it's um, also, it's very interesting that the, uh, the constitution of the state of Hawaii requires a balanced budget. And you wonder exactly how can you achieve that? I've always wondered about that. But it, it's not as simple as that, is it? Oh, no, there's certainly a lot of moving parts. Uh, and and l- let me just kind of give you an overview of what happened this legislature. Um, the legislature's vote to approve the budget bill was held on May 1st. It was approved, of course. The session ended on May 4th. The final worksheets for the budget were released on May 15th. So... Even for members of the legislature who were voting on the budget, a lot of the detail wasn't even available until a couple a couple of weeks after they voted. Can I just ask you this? You know, the, the, the way you put that, the implication is that, th- that they didn't exist or had not been finalized by the time the session was over. And in that 15-day hiatus... Um, what what you had with people catching up and actually writing them after the legislature was done? Am I right? Yeah, let me let me quote uh, Russell Ruderman, you know, former state senator. Um, he was quoted in Civil Beat about that, and what he said was, uh, "The budget bill was not finished by the deadline, and the leadership insisted that members voted it anyway, even though many important expenditures were still blank." That is. They voted on a budget bill date that they had not read because it wasn't written yet. There's something really not kosher about that, isn't there? And the question is, where's the accountability? Uh, Who is going to say, wait a minute, you know, you have your constitutional duties, procedures, obligations to conduct this, you know, a, a legislative session and you do it after the session. You do it without notice. You do it behind our backs. Um, Who is going to stop them from doing that? Who indeed? I mean, it's 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 a very tough problem because uh, what are you going to do? Sue to invalidate the entire budget and throw the entire state in chaos? Where's the governor? Well, the governor uh, has some ability to make some changes. I mean, he can line out and veto stuff, especially in in uh, in, in budgets like this. Um, but uh, you know his his power is pretty much limited to that. To say yes or no on you know either bills or uh, budget line items. Uh, if he says no, uh, yeah, you can you know you you can take out the appropriation, but that means there's no money. So well, let me let me let me ask you this. Uh, there's two thoughts that cross my mind, and of course we have a lot we have a lot to talk about today. But I just want to ask you this. Suppose he said. Now, that wasn't right. That was not legal. That was not appropriate. That was not sunshine. Um, I want you to call a special session and do it proper. And I want the public to have notice and transparency the way the Constitution uh, requires. So um, if you want the state to proceed, um, call a special session. Otherwise, I do not respect this budget. He could do that, couldn't he? Uh, In theory, I think he has the power to call a special session himself. Hmm. Well, what are they going to do? Well, they'll have to do it right, won't they? <laughs> well, is that going to happen? I mean, the, the last time, um, you know, there there was this you know special session for a controversial bill. I remember the uh, 2017 session with the the rail bailout, bailout bill. Basically, what happened was uh, once the um, you know the, the the session was gaveled in, everybody was reading from a script. They had the bill already worked out. They had, they had, they, they they held hearings, and they listened to testimony, but there was a predetermined outcome for each of the hearings. 
Hmm, that that sounds like what might happen again. But you know what? I mean, when when he does this, in my little model here, when he does this, he would say, "Really, uh, this is this is not kosher. Uh, you can't do this." And every time you do this, I am going in my term as as governor of the state. I, I am going to call a special session. Get used to it, and get used to the fact that I'll be watching you and I'll be making public statements about it. What about that? Would that help? It might help. Yeah. Um, I think I think somebody's got to uh, rein in some of this abuse that's going on. Um, there, 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 there does have to be public accountability. Uh, if if the voters aren't going to, you know, render judgment, somebody's got to. It's an attitudinal thing, though, and it's an attitudinal thing that flows from a, a few powerful people in the legislature who have you know, created other problems, controversies, um, you know, abuses. And I know that um, you know in your in the discussion you contemplate for the show, um, there are other things. Why don't you talk about the other things? Well, well, first off. Um, remember, there is a $200 million item uh, that the governor can spend at his discretion. Uh, the, the big issue with that money isn't the basic concept, i.e. governors have been given discretionary funds before, uh, but the way it made its way into the budget bill. Uh, it was not in the budget bill when the House Senate Conference Committee voted to approve it. Uh, but they voted to approve the bill with amendments, and that gave uh, the money chairs license to put other stuff in the in the bill, which they did. And the and of course the final vote was held later. I mean, even the the House Finance Chair admitted uh, that the two hundred million dollars was added to the bill after the conference committee voted on it, but before the final vote was taken. In both wow, houses. that that is really that sounds like a huge abuse and a hide the peanut thing in the in the um, in the scale of hundreds of millions, um, and which the public had no way of knowing about and could not have weighed in. That's right. There's there's a, there's a lot of other things that the public didn't know about and couldn't weigh in on, and we're going to go through them, you know, a few more of them later, uh, but. Uh, it did leave a bad taste in the mouth uh, in the mouth of some of the House members, and so uh, there were a few who actually voted against it. Uh, you know, I, I I don't know what's going to happen to them next session. Whether they're going to be stripped of, you know, committee assignments for failing to toe the line, but we got to you know we'll have to see. That's another aspect of the abuse. Um, it really sounds like the you know the autocratic approach. Uh, if they don't join you on whatever you're doing, even if it's wrong, you punish them. Yep. Um, and there, there's even, I think, uh, some instances of uh, you know disrespecting the, the bicameral nature of our legislature. Uh, we've heard a lot in the news about the first responders training facility near Mililani mm -hmm. uh, that was championed by uh, Senator De La Cruz because it's in you know his district. Mm -hmm. uh, it was included in an appropriation for the High Technology Development Corporation. Now, earlier in the session, um, there was actually a bill to authorize the first responders technology campus. And uh, the House Higher Education and Technology Committee um, chaired by Representative Amy Peruso, uh, she didn't move the bill. Thought it was dead. Yep, she thought it was dead. She but, was the one to know. Yeah. Uh, but but guess what? Uh, $50 million went into the budget anyway to support this project. But then there was the story of um, Priscilla Sirmos uh, on the uh, high tech, the Hawaii Tech Development Corporation. What happened there? Oh, yeah, there was uh, lots of news coverage uh, on on that, including this morning. Um, uh, what happened there was uh, Priscilla Simos is uh, one of the vice presidents at the University of Hawaii. He's on the board of High Technology Development Corporation. 
and uh, he was against this this project. So uh, what happened was there was a um, a bill to appropriate some money to the High, Techno High Technology Development Corporation. And it got changed at the last minute in conference committee uh, to add a provision that changes the qualifications for the board of the High Technology Development Corporation. Specifically, it says that uh, vice presidents at the university can no longer be on the board. It has to be a regent. Um, so you know, really, really, Tom, just stopping you right there. That is, that is poppycock. That is ridiculous. I was the chair of the then called the High Tech Development Corporation. And uh, Vasilis uh, Samos would have been a, a great catch for us because he's very senior at the university. Um, he supervises, uh, the, or he has supervised the, the tech elements of the university. Um, the few people in the state would know more uh, about tech research uh, than uh, Vasilis, and uh, he would be a great catch as um, a member of the board of the Hawaii Tech Development Corporation. To exclude him, you know, that's like um, pretty clear what they were doing. They were Anyway, go ahead. Yep. And um, uh, Civil Beat this morning was quoting Representative Quinlan as basically saying, look, um, I was given the choice of either voting for this bill in conference committee or, or saying no and uh, a key appropriation for HTDC would then fall to the, fall to the cutting room floor. And and he was concerned about having that appropriation in there, so so he he went along with it. So this is how this is House Bill nine ninety nine, and so we'll see what we'll see what the governor does with it. But apparently, it's paired with a an appropriation of some kind. Uh, so if if the bill's vetoed, there'll be financial consequences to HTDC as a result. And. Uh, where is Vasilis? Is he on the board of HTEC? Oh. He's on the board now. Yeah. That was um, clear, a clear attempt at retribution. It was a clear attempt at trying to control um, the members and thus the votes of HTDC on this issue, wasn't it? Not only that, but, uh, uh, you know, the executive director of HTDC, Len Higashi, he yeah. just resigned. Ah, he just quit. Ah, you know, you would think they, they they would they would not politicize HDDC. Its mission is so clear and useful. He quit. He quit. I guess I'm making a guess here uh, because of the politicization. Don't you think? Um, I I don't think he he uh, was reached to uh, comment on that, but uh, that is uh, it's very suspicious. It's very suspicious, and I think what your you know your explanation makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, let me let me kind of show you uh, what these legislative worksheets that we've been talking about are, and you know what they look like, and, and what this vehicle called a legislative adjustment is. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the first uh, the first slide, which is uh, page four of one thousand seventy. That's there are 1,070 pages in the bu in the budget worksheet, so two reams of paper and then some. Well, here's what it says. This is this is a uh, you know two columns. One is uh, one on the right is the governor's request. On the left is the you know what's in the budget bill, and uh, the governor asked for 1.5 million dollars uh, for a, the coconut rhinoceros beetle task force which is 750K, and a green waste program, 750K. And on the left side, it says legislature does not concur, and there's no money. So basically what they're doing is they're taking, the, taking that governor's request and zeroing it out. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one way uh, budget worksheets work. Let's go to the next page, page 5 of 1070. Did they have a vote on this? They have a vote on this. Yes, they they 
they they can approve the budget bill or die. <laughs> Got it. So this one is a uh, a governor's request to add funds for plant pest and disease control. This one this one says legislature concurs, and this money is you know uh, shifted over to the left left hand column where where the uh, where the money is uh, there, and on the bottom of that page. There is uh, a paragraph that says legislative adjustment. Add funds for plant pest and disease control. Now, this is what a legislative adjustment is. So they, they put something into the budget worksheet under a, um, a particular program, and they add money to it. In this case, they're adding $2 million. Um, Beyond and what the governor asked for. Yeah, but but it's interesting because they 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 put in um, coconut rhinoceros task force one million dollars, green waste program one million dollars. So so they basically zeroed out the governor's request and they added more money. Um, how's that how's that possible? When you shake it and bake it, is that legal? Uh, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it it's it's in the um, it, it's in the final version of. House Bill 300, the legislature voted on it. So it, when 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 the governor signs it into law, if he does, uh, then it then it's then it's totally legal. Okay. You have a number of other points, um, you know, that are of interest here. Uh, and then uh, there was um, the school teachers uh, who negotiated for 180 some odd million dollars in raises, um, but that negotiation. Yep, they got the result of that negotiation was not what the budget has said it would pay. What? How, how come there can be a discrepancy like that? It was not a discrepancy. It's a, it's a different bill. Uh, what what the what the legislature did uh, was they 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 passed HB ten oh four, which funded the the teachers for one hundred eighty seven million. Uh, but in the budget bill, they kind of got the uh, education department back by saying, okay. Uh, that's going to cost you 167 million, almost the same amount. Not quite, but almost the same amount. But 20 million dollars, Tom. If you ever feel that's not much of a difference, uh, let me know because I could, I could really use that money for Think Tech Hawaii. Actually, <laughs> as could we all. <laughs> that's a lot of bread. Um, okay, so they they negotiated 187 million, and, um, but in the budget they got 167 million. Uh, who who uh, handles the shortfall? DOE. So uh, I, I suppose then that uh, the short end of the stick would fall on the HGEA members. So they wouldn't get the raise they thought they negotiated? Well, uh, HSTA got the raise. HGEA is another union uh, c comprising not the teachers, but the administrators and the... Um, uh, you know, the, the high, higher mucky mucks uh, in the Department of Education structure, which is huge, by the way. I know. But, why, you know, why the difference? I mean, if you if it's right there on your desk and it says they negotiated $187 million in raises, and that what, is it an eyesight question? How come they gave them $20 million less? Did they not understand what the negotiation was? Did they... Uh were they renegotiating? Is that what they were doing? Uh, hard to tell, but uh, apparently there were some people in the, you know, some powerful people in the legislature saying, "Okay, there's got to be a cost to this, so somebody somebody has to bear the cost." Hmm. What is what is kind of more uh, interesting is the Hawaii Tourism Authority, hmm. um, because uh, between the different bills to to basically defund the, the the tourism authority and or uh, blow it up and make it into something else. Uh, all of the money for the Hawaii Tourism Authority kind of fell by the wayside. So they have no appropriation. So either uh, the governor uses some of that two hundred million to to prop up HTA for another, you know, for another couple of years, uh, or HT withers on the vine. What, what does that mean? What does that mean to the HTA not having any money? What What is the effect of that? 
Well, you can't you can't pay people, so you can't do anything. It sounds like the debt ceiling issue on the federal level. You're stuck. Well, it's it's even worse than that because you can't then you can't spend any money at all. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I'm trying to make sense of all this and find a common denominator. And a couple of things that occur to me in light of our discussions uh, on a variety of shows in the past about uh, the special funds and all that. It's like you have two realities. Um, one reality is, uh, well, you're supposed to have the structure and and um, the special funds are really not a good idea in the structure. And the second is you have to have a balanced budget. OK, we know that. Um, and you have to um, you know gauge your spending by what the Council on Revenue Revenues tells you, uh, you know, at the beginning of the, of the session. And the third thing, and this is really important, it has to go through the process. You have to respect the committees. You have to respect their votes. You have to respect the law, really. Um, that's on one side of the, of the ledger, so to speak. And on the yeah, that's good side, in theory. In, yeah, practice, yeah. in practice, we see it's a little bit different. That's the point. Yeah. In practice, we see it's a little different. People disregarding, um, tucking money away in special funds that sit there uh, and, you know, with completely dysfunctional. And then the, the legislature and its committees does one thing, um, but uh, somehow, somehow, and it's not known exactly how, a few choice, powerful individuals, you know, they do what they want, regardless of what the legislature has, has voted for. And the public, um, you know, they're the victims. The, the public are uh, completely on the outside of this, and the, and they are, an announcement is made about this is what it's going to be, um, and and the governor doesn't have that much control over it, and it doesn't sound to me like from a fiscal policy point of view, fiscal policy may not be the right word from a, a fiscal process point of view, it is not what it should be. It is something different. What do you think? It's definitely different. I mean, you you would. Um hope that in a in a, in a good democracy uh that people would know what they're voting on uh, that the detail would be out there that people would, you know could comment on it um and you know all of the uh, comments taken into account uh you know they may, they might not necessarily agree with every, every commenter but at least there's a process for for views to be made known um a lot of what we've just been talking about is action uh, outside of the public comment process without any public comment. Um, and even, you know, in, flying in the face in some, in some instances of the duly organized committees that did hold a hearing and did take public input and thought it wasn't a good idea. Wow, we have a it's, problem in Mudville. Um, so, you know, I mentioned before the possibility of the governor, you know, being fully advised and he's well experienced in these matters. He served in the Senate for a long time, um, could say something. He could say it to them, uh, either on the, you know, jawbone level, a, a visit from the fifth floor to the, what are the, the third and fourth floors of the, of the square building. <clears throat> or he could go public and say, this isn't working well. Um, I, I am going to expect better. He could say that. Of course, that's politically dangerous. Those same people who seek retribution against uh, members of HTD, for example, you know, would seek retribution against him. Um, but the that other would be easy enough. That would yeah, be easy enough. Sure, yeah, he's I the mean, governor, right? Yeah, and 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 it would be very easy for for those individuals to say, "Okay, uh, there's there's no budget, and it's your fault." Right. The 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 blame game theater. Yeah, uh, but let me let me offer another thought. Is what about the state auditor? Is this something that could, does, should fall on the desk of the state auditor uh, to look at this and say there's something wrong here? Well, um, I think there's an inherent conflict because the state auditor is a legislative agency. Mm. Um, it's it, it's created to serve the legislature and report to the legislature. So. It's probably not going to be assigned to uh, scrutinize and report in its own self. Mm. Um, who then could call for reform or accountability? Does it have to be a, a federal agency, a federal investigative body? Who then? Maybe the AG. 
we have an attorney general mm -hmm. supposed to enforce the laws. Um, if there are laws that are not being followed, the AG is supposed to do something about it. Mm. And, but the uh, AG works for the governor. That's right. AG's executive branch. Yeah. So you, you don't have the same conflict. You know, in the, in the larger picture here, you know, you have a, a failure of the, of the process of the state as laid out. You have a failure of the, um, the procedures in the legislature as laid out. And as we voted for legislators who would follow these procedures. And if they're not being followed, there's really something wrong. And so um, I, here's my, my concern about all of this. You know, these things, um, I don't think that people care that much if they know at all about these things. But they are likely to get worse, don't you think? Because if you, if you get away with something, uh, then you're likely to try something more aggressive. Uh, is that happening? Yeah, no, is no, I, 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 think, I think that is uh, part of the dynamic. Uh, it's been said that absolute power corrupts absolutely, and and you and you see uh, that the money chairs of the, of both chambers, and I think more, um, you know, more with uh, the the Senate Ways and Means Chair, uh, he's got power and he's throwing you know, throwing his weight around. You know, and I, and I think think something something's got to be done about that. Is this Just as a matter of. Too much concentration of power. Is this something that that um, is only recent, or has it been happening over the years? I think it's uh, worse than usual. There, there has been a lot more. I think power flexing um, in recent years. Uh, this year, we also saw a lot of bills uh, being killed by the speaker. Because you know things would go to conference, and uh, for some reason or, or, or other, House conferees wouldn't get appointed. So, or or House conferees that that are appointed would get dismissed, and that kills the bill. So, either the Speaker of the House or the Senate President has basically a veto power over all bills. Okay, and. Uh, uh, it just so happens that, that the House Speaker has been exercising that veto power a lot more recently. Yeah, it's a, another way to kill a bill, just a, another way, and it's in, focused in the hands of only a couple people. The, the, um, by the way, the, the, the doctors, you know, we have a serious doctor shortage in the state. We're, we're down by 800 doctors against what we should have. And that affects public health, and it, it affects health care around the state, especially the neighbor islands, and um, you know, especially people who are disadvantaged. And um, it was important to try to pass some bills to slow down the doctor shortage and make life and practice in Hawaii more appealing to doctors. And there were a bunch of bills that were passed, that were passed by both houses of the legislature. But they were killed for at the last moment for, because um, somebody failed to appoint a member of, of the uh, conference committee. And boy, the doctors were hoo-hoo about that. They worked so hard, put in thousands of hours trying to explain to everybody about how the doctor shortage was serious and how it could be remedied, at least in part. And it got the bills passed, but then they failed at the last minute. And you can't tell me that was a sleight of hand mistake. It, it wasn't. It was. It had to be intentional. It's not that hard to appoint a member of a conference committee, is it? No, no, not at all. I mean, it's just again, the speaker, the Senate president, uh, wielding veto power, mm. which is what it is. Mm. Yeah. Well, okay. I I wish I could say that we have come up with some solutions here, Tom. Well, uh, we haven't yet, but we, we know at least where the, a lot of the problems are. So hopefully we can you know, focus more attention on that, and then people can actually sit down and look at these and try to come up with some real solutions. Mm -hmm. What does the Washington Post say? 
that democracy dies in darkness. We really have to keep the light shining. Yep, and we got a lot of shadow to worry about. So, <laughs> Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on the show. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.